Sorry for coughing there. I'm curious, what day is today? Sunday, yeah, that's the correct answer. What else is today? Ascension Sunday, yes. That is correct. If you looked at your bulletin and thought I had given up on Matthew because it was getting too tough, maybe, but not really. We are in Hebrews today because today marks a special day, which is exactly Ascension Sunday. Ascension Day was actually on Thursday um, of this last week, so three days ago. Uh, And I'm curious here, who is uh, either old enough or has grown up in a maybe a different Christian tradition uh, that you remember celebrating Ascension Day in church? Who has done that? Okay, quite a few. Um, Who has been recently in churches that celebrate Ascension Sunday? Makes sense. That would match my experience. <laughs> okay, uh, Ascension Sunday is a significant day on the Christian calendar. Um, at the time, we talked this morning in Sunday school about uh, the Reformation and some of the things that changed in that time, and there was lots of holidays, and some of it started to get a little out of hand, how many holidays there were on the church calendar. Uh, and the, the Protestants basically boiled down the church calendar to five evangelical feast days. Uh, and they are the Incarnation, which is Christmas, Jesus taking on human form, Good Friday, of course, we still celebrate that today as well. Easter, which we also continue to celebrate. Uh, And then the next two are Ascension Day and Pentecost. And these have been largely abandoned for the most part, for whatever reason. Uh, I think I've got a few theories on why that may be. Uh, I had one friend growing up who grew up uh, in Mexico. And for Pentecost, him and his dad always closed the shop. They had a mechanic shop in Landmark, still do. Uh, and they always closed it down for Pentecost, and I always thought that was strange, because that's the only time Pentecost ever crossed my mind. Um, <clears throat> but this is something, these days, Ascension Day and Pentecost, are historically days that the church has celebrated no differently than Christmas, Good Friday, or Easter. Uh, and only three of these have remained popular. The others have more or less been neglected. And I think it's worth considering, I don't have a definitive answer why, I'd be curious to hear other people's opinions on why this may have happened, how we have drifted away from this. Um, But I do think that the ascension of Christ and his much anticipated coronation into his kingship, where he goes to rule at the right hand of the Father, is a significant day. And it actually does kind of make sense, I do think, given some of the accommodations that the church has largely made in the last 50 to 100 years, why this doesn't seem like such a big deal to us anymore. So in other words, I do think it's possible that the neglect of Christ's kingship over the cosmos is both a cause and an effect of the pluralistic age in which we live and the exclusive claims of Christ to rule over all. But these five feast days, Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, Ascension, and Pentecost, along with the other details of the stories of both the Old and the New Testament, help us put dots on the story arc. So think of it like a, you know, connect the dots you did when you were a kid in a puzzle book, uh, and you start to see a trajectory of a line. And these five days on the calendar help us to kind of chart a course for the trajectory of redemptive history. They're key pieces on the timeline. Uh, And if we're missing two of them, it's understandable we may get our trajectory line a little off at places. Missing Christ's ascension does mean that we are missing a major piece, both in terms of Christian worldview thinking as well as in terms of where is this all headed. There's lots of reminders of sin and of shame and the corruption uh, of sin on the earth everywhere we look. And it's hard to see past that to what God is doing. There's one pithy little saying that I think is worth remembering. Uh, When we see sin and corruption and reminders of of all kinds of decay and rebellion around us, is that because of the fall, things are not as they ought to be. But because God is sovereign, things not being as they ought to be is exactly as they ought to be. (laughs) Okay, I'll say that again. Because of the fall, things are not as they ought to be. But because Christ is king and God is sovereign... Things not being as they ought to be is exactly as they ought to be. The story is following the the author's intent perfectly. Christ is king even when we see sin and corruption around us. The actions that we take in our daily lives uh, tend to just be steps towards a desired outcome that we want. And so when we 
when we're making decisions, when we make actions, we're always thinking of the next step. At least if you're at all strategic in your thinking, you're always thinking of, okay, if I, I need to do this in order for the next thing to happen. And I think that works in redemptive history as well. So for example, if I want to go fishing next Saturday, I need to be out of the barn earlier than normal. If I want to be out of the barn earlier than normal, I'm probably going to mix feed on Friday night instead of on Saturday morning. If I want to mix feed on Friday night, that means I mean bales in the yard, so I'm probably going to haul bales home Friday afternoon. See how this works? What I want to do in the future dictates what I'm doing today. We're reverse engineering what we want to do in the future. And we do this, as people, we do this imperfectly, knowing that our plans often are and can be derailed. But when God does this, he sets his course perfectly and inscrutably. He is the author of history, so his purposes will never be derailed. And so each step along the way of redemption is designed to secure the next step. It's designed to serve the next step. So if we think about the big days on our calendar, Christmas serves Good Friday. For Jesus to die on Good Friday, he needs to first be a man. So Christmas is serving Easter or Good Friday. Good Friday serves Easter. Easter serves the Ascension, and the Ascension serves Pentecost, and ultimately Christ's return, which is the one date yet future on our calendar. And these steps keep building higher and higher upon each other as God is unveiling his plan for his creation. And so if you think about it, the the, the weight we put on these holidays is almost backwards. I'm glad that we celebrate Christmas as much as we do, but we should make a much bigger deal out of Good Friday. And then we should make a bigger deal yet out of Easter. And by the time we get to Ascension and Pentecost, how big a party should we be throwing for these events? Christmas should be our smallest and most modest of all of these celebrations if we really think about their significance. And so when we're faced with these kind of days, and normally we just do sequential expository preaching, which I think is the right diet overall, but we, we sometimes stop on these days on the calendar to look at something in redemptive history. And we want to zoom out and to see the trajectory that redemptive history is going so that it can give us a sense of perspective as we live and manage our way in the world around us. And so if we don't see the whole range of what God has done and is doing now, it can become common to reduce the whole thing down very small and very individual. And I'm a big believer in making individual application. But sometimes we negotiate the the gospel down so that it's just about personal salvation. That's the whole story of the Bible is just, you know, get on a life raft because the Titanic is sinking. Uh, And we reduce it down to just that. And I will be the the first to say that personal salvation is absolutely essential. It is a non-negotiable. But I'd follow it up with this. It's serving a greater purpose. Okay, personal salvation is not the end of redemptive history. It's the means which is serving the greater purpose. Personal salvation serves the broader purpose of God's plans for his creation. He is pushing back the curse of Eden. He is making all things new. He is healing the divorce between heaven and earth, which is finally healed and consummated once for all at the wedding feast of the Lamb when Christ returns to wrap up history. So one by one, personal salvation are incremental steps along the way to get us there. They're serving the greater goal of what God is doing. God is making men and women new now so that they are prepared to live eternity with him in the new creation. And the incarnation of Christ has the divine and the human touching each other in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is the starting point of this reunification process of heaven and earth. God and creation touch each other in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is going to ripple out through all history. The ascension of Christ means that this project has been successfully accomplished by Christ and having accomplished his father's will, the mission on which the father sent the son, he now grabs hold of his inheritance as king of kings and lord of lords. And so the fact of Jesus' ascension isn't really a disputed point in history. Luke ends his gospel and opens Acts with the the account of the ascension in Acts 1, 6 through 11. So when they had come together, and you can turn there if you want, Acts 1, 6 through 11. I'll give you a minute. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the apostles, perhaps understandably, are thinking that this event is going to be just like Israel's previous deliverances, where they can come out from under the yoke of an evil empire who was oppressing them. They don't yet understand that the exodus of Moses wasn't the glory days that they're trying to get back to, but was just a picture of an even more glorious salvation that yet await us. The exodus is just a faint, shadowy type of the deliverance that God is intent on giving to his people. And then, as now, we sometimes struggle with nostalgia, and I criticize myself. I am a very sentimental and nostalgic person. But the problem with nostalgia is that it tends to see the past as the high watermark that we want to get back to. Whereas trusting the Lord's purposes means that what's ahead of us must be better than what's behind us. We've got to keep moving ahead. Christ promises his spirit, which is now going to come nine days after the ascension. And the timing here is actually remarkable. Uh, the ascension is 40 days after Easter. Uh, and the, uh, the date of Pentecost, depending on how you count it, actually, with the Easter events, Pentecost means 50, right? Pente, the Pentagon has five sides. Pentecost is 50 days, but you can also count it correctly as 49 days, which is seven weeks, which scripturally is significant. We'll look at that more next week. But Christ has promised his spirit, which is going to come nine days after the ascension. And in the power of the spirit, the apostles are going to continue their preaching, expanding their focus from Jerusalem. And that's what we've been seeing in the Gospel of Matthew. They're starting in Israel. They're starting in Jerusalem and Judea. And this needs to get out to Samaria and ultimately to the ends of the whole earth. And so what Christ is embarking upon here is clearly a better exodus. Because now the design isn't just to get rid of the occupiers and go back to your homeland. But the goal here is to push out, to expand. We're not just trying to get back to what we had. Now we're pushing out. We're expanding. The gospel needs to get to the end of the earth. And so when Christ is taken up in a cloud, which is how God often has displayed his glory all through redemptive history, the Shekinah cloud, we all remember the cloud that that Israel followed in the wilderness. Christ is taken up into this glory cloud, And we see, again, the importance of two angels testifying to a historic event. On Easter, we looked at the two angels guarding the Garden of Eden, the gate on the east in Genesis 3.24. Two angels were put symbolically over the cover of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25.18. Two angels were sitting at the opening of Jesus' tomb, announcing the resurrection in John 20, verse 12. And now... Two angels are announcing the ascension of Christ and giving him the promise of his return. And I would suggest if we are reading with open eyes, the Old Testament is pregnant with the promise of ascension. But it does remain shadowy until the appointed time. And so today's main text that we want to look at in Hebrews 1 uh, uh, gives us a theological meaning for the ascension. Luke more or less tells it as a historical event, but there's something deeper. What does this mean? Okay, yes, this happened. What does it mean? And that's what we want to look at today. So turn in your Bibles to today's text, which is Hebrews 1, 1 through 5. And as this is our main text, I'll ask you to stand as we read God's word. Hebrews 1, 1 through 5. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And may God bless the reading of his word. So the author of Hebrews, his whole project in writing this book 
is to show Jewish converts to Christianity the superiority of the new covenant, what lies ahead, to show how it's better in every way than the shadows and the promises in the past. The substance has now come. That's the thrust of this book. And he does this in a very uh, interesting, and we would, of course, say God-inspired way in the way he shows continuity and discontinuity between the old types and shadows and the new substance in Christ. Verse 1 opens up, says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And so he starts by showing the harmony and the continuity of one big story in Scripture. Notice how he says, our fathers. He's connecting himself. He's showing unity. Um, <clears throat> and he's connecting the current situation in the church to the prophets of old. And he does this in many ways. The Old Testament, we, it, it's not like it just dropped out of heaven and landed on a satin pillow itself. The Old Testament itself is written over thousands of years. Many cultural changes have happened from Job, which is probably the oldest book, until we get to uh, finally where the Old Testament closes with the Babylonian captivity. So it's not like this is just one group of people. This was a long story itself over time. And the author here is making direct connection, showing continuity. This is our fathers. And in Hebrews 1 alone, there are over 30 explicit references to Old Testament texts. So the author of Hebrews is being very intentional to show, to connect the dots. This is one story. Okay? There's no artificial disjunction uh, between what God is doing and what he is doing. Uh, this is one long story that keeps progressing and getting higher and bigger and better. But in verse 2 he goes on and says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So where verse 1 is emphasizing continuity, verse 2 is now showing discontinuity. Something has progressed in the story. Something is different when he says, but in these last days. So we're in a different chapter. Yes, it's the same story, but we're in a different chapter now. It's progressed. That he has spoken to us by his son. Okay, so past tense it was the prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken by his son. So we had prophets, now we have the substance. We have the son of God himself. And he speaks of the current time that he is living in as the last days. So this is the last chapter of history that he is looking at, the days between Christ's first and his second coming. These are the last days in this final chapter, after which Christ has completed all his work, but which is still waiting for his return at the very end of history. So yes, we are living in the last days. Just like the author of Hebrews, just like Ambrose, just like Athanasius, just like Tertullian, we are living in the last days in this sense. And Christ really is God's last word to his creation. The whole book of Hebrews is about the superiority of the new covenant and how Christ fulfills and perfects once and for all everything that was promised in the old days. He shows throughout the book that Christ is the greater prophet than Moses. He is the greater priest than Aaron and he is the greater king than David. And so Christ is naturally the termination point of all the prophets all the priests and all the kings. He fulfills this perfectly. He's fulfilled all these offices perfectly and has since made them obsolete. This is why we don't have these people in the church today. We have ministers, we have deacons, we have other people kind of serving in somewhat analogous roles, but we don't have prophets today to deliver the word of God. We don't have priests who offer sacrifices and we don't have kings who rule over the church. Things have moved on as we have the substance in Christ. And verse 2 also tells us that Christ is the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And this is a very direct and intentional reference to Psalm 2, verse 8, which Tim uh, showed us this morning. While the man, Jesus of Nazareth, clearly has a beginning, the second person of the Trinity is eternal. And he is the one by whom God created the world. If you want to thumb around, we're going to look at a few different places this morning here. In Colossians 1, verse 6... And you can keep your thumb there because we're going to go back to Colossians a few more times. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Christ created all things, visible and invisible, spiritual and material, and the purpose is made clear here. He's not just making them for the sake of making them, to fill the boredom, 
He's not making them to see how the story is going to turn out if he winds up the clock and then lets it go on its own. They are created for him. For him. For him. Well, what about all the bad guys like Pharaoh? Well, what does Romans say about Pharaoh? For this very purpose I raised you up that I may display my glory against you. The bad guys are also put in the story for Christ, for Christ to get glory. That is the point of all history. So the whole point of creation is for the mutual glorification and satisfaction of father and son. Invisible principalities and earthly kings and rulers are all made so that Christ can somehow or another get the glory over them and through them. Verse 3a says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so the radiance here is not just a mere reflection, like the moon reflects the light of the sun. And it's not either that Christ is just a man who's been given extra charismatic gifts from God. Rather, the sun is the radiance which emanates from God. And this is what it means that the sun is begotten of the Father. It's not that the second person of the Trinity has a beginning. It's that he is eternally the sent one. And the Father is eternally the one sending. The relationship between Father and Son is a relationship of eternal begetting. This is what it means. It's not that he has a beginning, only that him and the Father always have, do, and will relate to one another as a Father and Son relate to one another. The one sending and the one sent. And as the Son, he is the exact imprint of his nature. The Father and Son and Spirit all exist in perfect triune harmony, Three persons in one perfect Godhead. So there is one substance, and so the relationship between Father and Son is a perfect one. There's no clash of wills between them. They are one perfect God. And the Father has sent the Son to take on a physical human nature so that he could be the mediator through which God and humanity can touch each other again. He came into a physical world, bringing his kingdom down with him in order to start putting heaven and earth back together. It's the long rehavenization process which is possible only through the gospel of Jesus Christ and no other ways. If you still have your thumb in Colossians 1, let's keep reading, verse 17 through 20. It says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, note this, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So the goal here isn't to destroy things, and Tim also read that in John three seventeen. He didn't come on a, a mission of condemnation, but on a mission of forgiveness, to reconcile all things, to put it back together. And so it makes sense. Again, we've talked about this in the past. Uh, this concept of annihilation that's becoming so popular just simply does not make sense. If you are eternal rebel against God, you are eternally in the outer darkness. All things are held together by the will of Christ. And right now, this moment, if Christ was not upholding warmth and gravity and light and your lungs and your heart this room would implode into nothingness if Christ was not upholding it right this very second. We are fragile people living in a fragile world. And if Christ was not upholding it perfectly and meticulously, it would fall apart. The wheels would come off. All things on heaven and earth are being reconciled to him. And this means that whatever our field of interest, whether that be architecture or engineering or banking or law or biology or art, or family, or space travel, all exist for the glory of Jesus Christ. They must be put in service under subjection to him. This is what it means that Christ is king of all. If Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Steve Lawson often says that phrase, and it took me a little while to catch on what he means by that, but it's absolutely true. If Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. There is someone that has a, a valid rival claim to authority somewhere in the cosmos apart from Christ. And friends, that is impossible. Christ is Lord of all, including the bad guys, in the Bible and today, of all. After making purification for sin, starting in 3b, 
He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Christ's death is the once and for all permanent final payment for sin. There's nothing more to do after this. And his resurrection shows that his sacrifice has been accepted by the Father, and his ascension shows that the work of his first coming is completely complete. It's done perfectly. This is why he can take his spot rightfully at the right hand of the majesty on high. The perfection of Christ's work is, in fact, the main theme of Hebrews. If you want to turn over in Hebrews to 10, uh, chapter 10, verses 11 through 14, it talks about the superiority of Christ. Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down, past tense, notice this, past tense, at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so taking his place at the right hand of the Father means that Christ has all authority and all dominion right now. He is not just reigning from an earthly copy somewhere, but from the throne room of God. And note this, he is sitting. He's sitting. This is sometimes called the session of Christ. Uh, in theology, the session of Christ just means that time where Christ is currently, right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it is significant what he is doing as he sits. He's done his working. He can rest as he exercises his dominion over his creation. And notice, you'll see, in, if you look through these offices that pointed to Christ, prophet, priest, and king, all of three of these offices are hinted at before Christ takes his seat. He has completed his work as prophet, verse 2a. He has completed his work as priest, verse 3a. And by taking the throne with his father, he has completed his work and is now coronated as king of the universe, verse 3b. Christ takes his throne as a victorious and conquering king, not as a defeated martyr. He has graduated from humiliation to exaltation. And so the image of the suffering Christ is true of Jesus' earthly ministry and his earthly struggles. But it is not an accurate picture of his current position as king and lord. Suffering was merely the pathway to his coronation. By humbling himself in human nature, Christ voluntarily took a position a little lower than the angels for a little while. For a little while. But by ascending to heaven, he has become much superior to the angels. In Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 5, both make direct reference to Psalm 2, which was read this morning. And why don't we turn there as well? Showing Christ as the fulfillment of this Psalm of David. <clears throat> Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers counsel, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the, and this is exactly what Hebrews is quoting here. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so Hebrews 1, which we've read here, borrows especially from Psalm 2, verse 7 and 8, talking in the past tense. This is completed. Christ has taken this throne. Christ did not ascend to get away from the world, or that he gave up, or to show us a way of escape out of the world, but rather to make the nations his heritage. 
Salvation is ultimately not about being removed from the world, but inheriting it as Jesus promised to his meek followers in Matthew 5, verse 5. How often do we miss that? What shall the meek inherit? The earth. This is the last chapter of history. And these last days, while Christ is ascended, is about making the ends of the earth his possession. God's removing his enemies, like in the days of Noah, to make way for the righteous to inherit it. Hebrews 10.13, which we also read recently, borrows from the same theme, but it quotes from God's favorite Bible verse, which is, God's favorite Bible verse is, Psalm 110, verse 1. The most repeated psalm, the most repeated Bible verse in the New Testament. So let's not miss where the story is going. Psalm 110 is quoted more than any other passage in the New Testament. A total of 19 direct references, one of which is here. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, and you'll see in your Bibles, the first Lord is uppercase, the second Lord is lowercase. This is David writing. So God says to David's Lord, Jesus, his grandson, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Hebrews 1.10, or Hebrews 10.13 is just one of 19 places in the New Testament where this verse is repeated. It is a major theme in the New Testament. The ascension of Christ to the right hand of the Father from where he puts his enemies under his feet is the overriding theme of the New Testament. And for as much emphasis as there is, for as much as Psalm 2 and Psalm 110.1 get used like no other Old Testament passages in the New Testament, it is amazing how much of this has been lost from contemporary theology in recent decades. Yes, we say Jesus is Lord, but what do we mean? What do we mean by that? So much of the current Christian scene has been marked by trying to avoid hardship. We've enjoyed our ease. Escaping the world, separating ourselves from difficulty, backing away from things which previous generations of Christians have built, obeying the demands of our idols and our false gods that make demands on us. But the ascension of Christ to the right hand of majesty is a reminder that Christ says, mine, about every last square inch on this planet and in the cosmos. Do you think he walked through all that suffering, all the heartbreak, the torture, the condemnation, the mockery, the abandonment, the death, just to be resurrected and ascend to heaven and then not lay claim of his inheritance? Do you think he forgot to ask for Canada and Brazil and China? More specifically, do you think he forgot to ask for you? Because this is true, not only the nations are given to Christ, but what are nations comprised of? People. You. One by one. This is where individual salvation fits the picture. Christ's atonement is perfect. That means you can be adopted into Christ. You can be united to Christ. Your sins can be forgiven. If he has done all this, do you think adultery is unforgivable? Or murder? Or theft? Or lying? Or abortion? Or anger? These are all things that Christ has atoned perfectly for. And if you are in Christ, he is happy to forgive every last one of them. And so our work as Christians... The church's mission today, now as always, is to make Christ's reign and rule visible, to turn it from the invisible to the visible. That is the whole work of the kingdom while the Lord tarries. The church's preaching of the gospel means, uh, pardon me, is the means by which this invisible rule is made visible. And this is Paul's encouragement to the Romans. In uh, Romans 16.20, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This is how Christ does it through the proclamation of the gospel in the church. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus bases the Great Commission on this. He says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice that Jesus doesn't just say go. Go and get Jesus elected president. Once we're at 51%, Jesus can be crowned king of the universe. No. What does Jesus say? All authority has been. This is just a fact. Okay, You can fight it, but it doesn't change the reality. Jesus Christ is Lord. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. Okay, We have a conquering message. We have a message of victory. If you are Christ's enemy, you will be shattered. Come with us. 
Come with us. Be forgiven. Enjoy peace with God. Christ is king. Bend the knee. Do it now. Don't wait. But before we can expect the world to receive this message, a good place would be if the church started to believe it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't this be great if we started here, believing in the kingship of Christ, believing in his sovereign right to number all our days, to give us the kind of providence he is pleased to give us? Yes, Christ is king of Canada and Portugal and Sudan. And we want to do the work there. We want people saved across the globe. And we frequently get discouraged and impatient that it's not going better or faster and things don't look brighter. But let's boil this down to an individual size where we can make application for ourselves. Boil it down to yourself. Does your life demonstrate the absolute authority of Christ's lordship? Does your life demonstrate that the lordship of Jesus Christ is a non-negotiable fact? Do your decisions and your habits reflect the values of an unbelieving world around you? Or do they reflect Christ and his kingdom? When things don't go as planned, as they frequently don't, do you panic? Or do you trust in the Lord's sovereign providence? When you sin, do you doubt that Christ can forgive you? That he has forgiven you? When Jesus is confronted by those who ask him about paying taxes, Jesus looks at the coin and asks whose image is on it. The people correctly answer that Caesar's image is on the coin. And so Jesus tells them, okay, pretty good. Caesar got his image on there. So you can render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And we take that as a reminder to pay our taxes. True enough. Christians should pay their taxes. We should be good citizens. But what screams in that story isn't anything about paying taxes. It's the unspoken assumption what's there. Whose image is on you? Whose image is on you? God's. So you cannot render yourself to Caesar. That's off the table. You belong to God. Your kingship or his kingship in your life is ultimate. That's the ultimate allegiance. This isn't a passage about paying taxes. Yes, that's a totally valid application. But this is about God's image being on you. You must submit yourself to Christ the same way that you pay your, t- your coin back to Caesar. He owns it. He owns you. Bend the knee. All allegiance belongs to Christ the King. And Caesar is not just invited but commanded to kiss the Son. And this is an important reminder. We so often treat the gospel as an invitation, and that is true. But who knows that the gospel is also a command? Jesus commands all people everywhere to repent. You must do this. You must. You must bend the knee to King Jesus. To give our ultimate allegiance to a man or to an idolatrous way of thinking is to miss everything that's happening. It's to miss the ascension of Christ. And when we fight sin and idolatry in our lives, what we are actually doing, what we ought to be doing, is pressing in to the ascension of Christ. And if your thumb is still in Colossians, go to chapter 3 and look at the way we are instructed to fight sin. This is how we push the bounds of Christ's kingship in our lives. Colossians 3, 1 to 5. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore. Notice the therefore. That means what follows is all based on what's just been said. And that is the pattern in the Bible. Romans is 12 chapters of knockout, dragout theology before we get to application. The fruit is not separated from the root, ever. To say, well, I'm just going to starve the root so I can focus on the fruit. That doesn't make sense. Or to say, I'm just going to feed the root and keep cutting off the fruit whenever it appears. That also makes no sense. Root and fruit are connected. They must be. Heart and head must be connected. And that's the basis on which we fight sin. These things are, they are true. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That's what sin is. Sin is idolatry. Sin is saying that there is some part of you that does not belong to Jesus Christ. It says, I am autonomous somewhere. 
I can pursue sexual immorality. I can pursue the love of money. I can pursue this, that, or the other thing apart from Christ, and it's all a lie. It's all idolatry. It's all setting up a false savior. That's what sin is. Our reunion with Christ means that the old man has died, past tense, with him. And the new man, past tense, was raised up to life in him. And now this new man starts to become what he is because we have ascended with him. What Christ does, those in union with him have also done. We were killed when Christ was killed. We were raised to life in Christ's resurrection. And we are ascended with the power that all that that means, the absolute lordship of Christ, when we fight sin. Daniel 7, there's a vision of the Son of Man ascending to the Ancient of Days. And I think that's talking about this. But if you read Daniel's prophecy further, there's a further interpretation that Daniel goes into that the Son of Man is a person, it's Jesus, and this is the title Jesus always uses for himself more than others. But it also becomes a composite of sons of man, believers in union with this man. And that's us. Just as we have died, just as we have been resurrected into new life, so we are in union with Christ as he sits and rules and puts his enemies under his feet. So when we fight sin in our own lives, it is never enough to tell yourself, well, I just need to quit sinning. Or to try to put evil desires away. Or worse yet, I've heard this one lots. Who's heard this one? I'm not going to do that because that's beneath me. That's beneath my dignity. What a surefire way to make sure you will fail in your fight against sin. It's the grace of God. It's ascension power. It's the lordship, the kingship, the absolute claims of loyalty that Christ commands of those who are in him and everywhere. Higher affections and higher allegiances need to displace the old sinful desires. We get rid of sinful desires by pushing them out with new desires. Christ says in Colossians, you are new, now start acting new. Okay? You are this, now start living like it. That's how we fight sin. And as people, as churches, as we successfully fight sin in ascension power, courage tends to grow. And the high points of the church have been products of high doctrine and holy living when they are put together properly. The story is told when John Knox came back from, uh, from Switzerland uh, that Queen Mary feared, she said she feared the prayers of John Knox more than she feared the assembled armies of Europe. Is that the kind of respect monarchs have for Christians today? Do they fear us more than they fear the assembled armies of the world? Simon Broadstreet, who was an old man, a governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony before independence, uh, was an old man. He was married to the poet Anne Bradstreet. Maybe you've heard of her. Uh, and there was a time when old you know, enemy troops were moving into his colony and working in this kind of confidence for the purposes of God and having no fear, a single old man, frail little old man, went up and he told the English army to turn back. And they obeyed him. <laughs> Okay? That's what fearlessness tends to do. They obeyed an old, withered-up man. Okay, he said, we got to go. I guess we got to go. Doesn't always turn out that way, but that's at least the template for the kind of courage that we can have when we're working in ascension power, especially when we live in an age of lies as we do. And we have to ask ourselves, when there's lies and deception all around us, where do lies get their power from? Where do lies get their power from the naivety and the cowardice of the people being lied to. Lies have no power, except if you're a coward and you listen to the lie. You give the lie the power. You give the lie the power when you don't fight it. We need courage from on high. We need courage from a victorious king. And indeed, that is what we have access to. The scriptures almost exhaust the language of victory and triumph when it speaks of Christ's ascension. And in closing, I want to look at the way Scripture talks about this. Don't turn in your Bible. This will be rapid fire. But think of the language. As his resurrection was the means to his ascension, and so a significant aspect of his total victory, so his ascension in turn was the means to his exaltation and enthronement, or his session, at the Father's right hand as the Holy One, Lord, Christ, Prince, and Savior of the world. Acts 2.27 33 to 36, and 531, Romans 8, 34, Colossians 3, 1, Philippians 2, 9 to 11, and Hebrews 1, 3. If his ascension was in glory, 
1 Timothy 3.16, exalting him thereby higher than all the heavens, Ephesians 4.10 and Hebrews 7.26, he is also now crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews 2.9, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him, 1 Peter 3.22, with everything under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15.26 and Ephesians 1.22, He is sitting far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come, Ephesians 1.21. God has also given him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Indeed, who fills the whole universe with his power and lordship, Ephesians 4.10. In sum, he now occupies the highest place. Philippians 2.9, of glory and honor, Hebrews 2.9, which heaven can afford, and to him belongs the title Lord of all, Acts 10.36, Romans 10.12, and Lord above all other lords, Acts 2.36, Philippians 2, and Revelation 19.16, that at the name of every knee, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The nature of his lordship entitles him to sovereignly bestow gifts to every and of whatever kind he pleases. Ephesians 4, 7 through 11. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for sending your son. Thank you that he has successfully completed what you have given him to do. He has broken the power in the domain of darkness. His death was vindicated by his resurrection. And Lord, because you have perfectly been pleased at him winning his inheritance, he is now sitting at your right hand in power and authority, commanding all people everywhere now to repent. Lord, I pray that as a church, as individual believers here, that we would work with ascension power as we apply the gospel to our own lives, as we fight the remains of sin and darkness that live in our own hearts and in our own minds, and also with a bold confidence as we grapple our way through the idolatry and the darkness around us. Lord, I pray that we would be like saints of old who are not trying to get you to be Lord, but who are announcing that you are and giving terms of peace to those around them. Lord, I pray that we would have that kind of confidence as we go out, as we share the gospel, as we live lives that are consistent with the gospel that our mouths preach. Lord, help us. Help us to be faithful. Help us to live gladly under your dominion, under your authority, and under your title of Lord of all. Pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.